All right, so ladies and gentlemen, this is the master class on organic chemistry. Well done on getting your place in it. This evening, we're going to do a number of questions. I've got a selection of different multiple choice questions and then long questions from two full papers. I think that should take us to the end of the hour, but we're going to see how we go. All right, so first of all, um, I'm assuming that the papers that I've managed to get hold of are not papers that you would necessarily have access to. So I'm deliberately aiming to get papers that you wouldn't be able to find going through past papers. So hopefully that is the case and hopefully I do have things that you haven't necessarily done before. All right, without further ado, we're gonna get started. As usual in the master class, for those of you that haven't done one with me before, we do one question at a time. I know you can see ahead, if you really feel like it, you can race ahead of me. But the idea here is that you have an opportunity to try and answer the questions and then we go through the questions together. Okay, so you'll find that the first couple of multiple choice hopefully are easy. I think that a lot of the questions we're going to be doing tonight are easy, but they also rely on the fact that you're still able to answer the question. All right, so let's get started on question 1.1 which asks the question, which one of the following sets of compounds, one and two, consist of an alkene and an alkyne? Now, please, just something to be really pedantic about. It does not say that compound one must be the alkene and compound two must be the alkyne, all right? They didn't give you an option where they specifically said alkene and alkyne. There's a part of your brain that assumes it must go that way, but just be aware of the fact that they just said the sets must have an alkene and they must have an alkyne. They weren't specific about the order. All right, so I'm going to pause my sharing now and I'm gonna ask you all quickly to select your answer. When you've selected your answer, you can give me a thumbs up and then we'll go through the answers. All right, good, I can see a lot of thumbs already. Okay, fantastic. Looks like it's nearly everybody. So I think we're ready to go over the answer. Okay, now I'm gonna be mean this time. I haven't already picked my answer, but I know that if I've got an alkene, it'll have the general formula CNH2N. And if I've got an alkyne, it must be CNH2N minus two. So if I look at this formula, that's going to be an ene, okay? And this is also an ene because it's two to two. So both of those fit under the alkene bracket. That over there is an alkane because it's CNH2N plus two, which immediately rules this out. There wasn't an option of an alkane. C3H8 is once again an ene, so I don't even need to check the second part, which by elimination takes me to D, but let's double check, C4H8 makes that an alkene, and C3H6, that is going to be, if you think about it, it would be C3H2 times three is six, minus two is H4, so that's our iron, so our answer is in fact D. Can I quickly ask who got that one correct? Okay, fantastic, well done if you got it correct, that's very good. All right, let's quickly move on to the second question. The second question, you'll notice they're all 1.1, that's because they're usually the first multiple choice. Don't stress about the numbering. The organic compound below is a colorless volatile solvent used in coating and printing ink. Please, you don't need to stress what it is, but I just wanna quickly touch on a couple of ideas here. If something is colorless, it means, it doesn't mean that it's clear. Clear means light travels through it. Something being colorless means you wouldn't describe it with a color. So for example, if I'm talking about oros, like oros mixed in water, that would be described as clear and orange. It's not colorless. Whereas water is clear and colorless. Volatility or volatile solvents are solvents with exceptionally low um, boiling points. So they rapidly turn into a gas. So anything that's volatile has two properties. First of all, you shouldn't leave it out without a lid on because it will evaporate and you'll have nothing left. And secondly, they usually tend to be flammable and they're the things that we're worried about sparks being near because they can explode. 
The explosion is more from the fact that they're volatile, their vapors go into the air, and then any small spark can set off an explosion. All right, so enough about the background that's irrelevant to the question. Here's the structure. If you look carefully, and I'm not really giving away too much when I show this to you, but that shows us that it's an ester. So you then ask the organic acid used to prepare the above compound is, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pausing for just a second. This should not take you very long at all to figure out. Okay, I'm assuming most of you should already, in fact, have the answer. Good, I can see a couple of you. I'm assuming the rest of you have already put up your hand. Okay. You must tell me if I'm racing you a little bit too much, but I think a lot of this is very straightforward for you. Okay, and my answer here is that it's ethanoic acid. So if we cut through the middle of the O, which is the oxygen joining the two, this side has got two carbons, which makes my carboxylic acid that it came from ethanoic acid. Out of curiosity, which alcohol did we use to make this substance? Anyone can offer, volunteer? You can shout out, it's allowed. Anyone, I know you must know it. If you walk on, yes? Um, wouldn't it be propanol, no? It would be propanol. And one last question, okay, brilliant. I see all of the, the answers coming in. What is the name of this ester? Anybody? Okay, I've got a chat message. Okay, just wait. All right, so we've got a correct answer from... No, we don't. We've got a wrong answer from the WhatsApp group. Okay, so somebody else can shout out. Ma'am, I think it's propyl, propyl ethanoate. It's propyl ethanoate. That is correct. All right, so just be very careful. One of the most common in well common mistakes that people make, and I see somebody did already on the chat here, is you forget you only count this carbon and you forget that you must count that carbon as well. So just like this became ethanoic acid because it's got two carbons, you've got to make sure that you realize they're one, two, three, four. So that makes it, sorry, one, two, three, don't know where the four came. That makes it propyl and then the two carbons there make this ethanoate. All right, so well done if you managed to figure that out. I know I ask quite a lot of questions that aren't on organic chemistry on the question that's being asked. I usually tend to, I find that the questions that they ask are so limiting compared to what they could have asked. So I sometimes get agitated and I've got to ask the rest of my questions as well. It, it's good, it's, it's good practice and sometimes the questions are, are better than theirs. Okay. So question 1.2, because we've only done 1.1, says which one of the following homologous series does not contain a carbonyl group? Now, I'm going to be mean here, and I'm not going to remind you what a carbonyl group is. This question is a little bit borderline in terms of how comfortable we are asking it, because usually you're taught that a carbonyl group is found in a specific kind of compound. But when I did teach this to you, I did describe to you exactly what a carbonyl group was. And from that, you'll be able to see that only one of those does not contain it. All right, so I'm going to give you just a second to get through that, and then we're going to go over it, Nana. Okay, give me a thumbs up when you got your answer. Cool, well done. Good, good, good. All right, that looks like everybody. So I'm going to quickly continue here. The carbonyl group is technically the C double bond onto an O. We usually refer to it as being the functional group of a ketone, but technically a ketone also has the Cs on both sides. So it's a bit borderline as to whether the carbonyl group then refers to just this bit. When we go to university, that's a carbonyl group and we're happy with wherever it is. So your answer here should have been an alcohol. Your carboxylic acid has a C double bond O onto an O and an H. Please note that this question I already told you was a tiny bit borderline because I don't ever want you to, in an exam, be tempted to refer to this as a carbonyl and this as a hydroxyl. Yeah, I know that that's what they look like, but as soon as they're together, we must call them a carboxyl group. We can't split it up and go, oh, in the carbonyl of the carbox, you can't split it like that. So that's why this question is just a little bit borderline, but you can still work with it, okay? 
Our aldehyde is C double bond O straight on to H. So there's the carbonyl portion of it. And our ketone is C double bond O between two other carbons, each of which have three bonds. So although I'm not 100% nuts on the accuracy of the whole question, I think that it's a really interesting thing. Yes, so over here, this would be a four mile group. So this is where I said that this question gets a little bit iffy, is that's a carboxyl, this is a four mile, and this is the one that I would have described technically as being a carbonyl. But there are certain schools of thought where the C double bond O is a carbonyl. So I put this question in because maybe if the question had said which, said, which of the following homologous series does not contain a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, then it would have been more, more permissible. So just be aware of the fact that this is a tiny bit borderline in terms of what we teach you. All right. Okay. All right. So I assume everybody is good with that. And so far, the questions haven't been too challenging, too much thinking, but just a little bit, a healthy, a healthy dose of thinking. All right. I don't know if any of these are particularly difficult, but when we get there, we'll know. Okay. So question 1.3 says the structural formula of three organic compounds P, Q, and R are shown below. Which one of the following statements is correct? So it looks like two of them may represent the same substance or three of them may represent the same substance. Please look very carefully, very closely, and then decide on your answer. All right, I'm gonna quickly pause sharing. I'll come back to it in just a second. I think this question would have been made, made a little bit more interesting by somebody saying none of these are the same substance. But it isn't an option here, so I can't make it an option now. All right, give me a thumbs up when you got to your answer. I think this one is a rather easy one. It could have been made a lot harder, but it's still important that you're prepared to look for these kind of tricky ones. All right, most of you have already replied. So my answer here is A. I see P and R as being the same thing. Because the methyl group is on carbon number one, this actually makes it have a longest carbon chain of one, two, three, four carbons. So this would be described as being butane. And this would also be described as being butane. So both P and R are butane. Can I ask who knows the name of Q? What would you give the IUPAC name for Q as? Any volunteers? We need volunteers. Okay. I'm sure you do know it. <laughs> All right, so if we look at this middle one, yay, somebody's brave, thank you. So please, um, Nasir's got it right and Iman's got it right. It's 2-methylpropane. You need to see that your methyl group is on carbon number two. That's carbon number one and carbon number three. In fact, if we'd had one methylpropane, it would actually have been butane. Okay, so your answer here is 2-methylpropane. Uh, Okay, just be aware of the fact that if you ever write something and it's got one methyl something, chances are that you haven't counted your number of carbons in the longest chain correctly and you've picked the wrong chain. All right, so I'm going to quickly clear and scroll down. Now, we didn't spend a huge amount of our time in the last lesson doing intermolecular forces, but we did just touch on it. So I've got a question here. Which I'm desperately trying to just scroll on and it seems to really want to show me the whole page or none of the page. Uh, okay, it really isn't gonna allow me to do less than, there we go, okay. At least we can see the whole of the bottom here. Sorry for jumping you up and down. So the question here says, examine the statement regarding the compounds P to S in the table below. So if you look at these compounds, the first thing that you should notice is that every one of them starts and ends on a CH3. You should also see that there are a number of CH2s in the middle. That tells us that these are all alkanes. Since they are all alkanes, they are all gonna have the same type of intermolecular force. 
You can tell me which type of intermolecular force we find in alkanes. I did cover this aspect in the lesson. Um, what the type of in yeah? Iman? London forces, because they're completely non-polar. So we're looking here specifically at London forces. And what we would say is that compounds P, Q, R, and S all have London forces. So the type of force isn't what's different between them. Also, if you look at them, you'll see, because each of them starts with the CH3 and ends with the CH3 and only has CH2 in the middle, that we can describe all of these as being linear which means that what's differentiating them from each other is not the amount of branching because they're all perfectly linear. So I'm giving you a bit of a heads up here. What we're looking at is going to be the length of the carbon chain. Now, these type of questions are very popular at the moment in the matric exams where they will give you four statements or three statements and then options that involve the combinations of any number of these. I sometimes find this feels a little bit like a cheat question because they're not asking you one thing, they're asking you yeah, four things and you've got to get all four right usually in order to get the answer. So it sometimes feels like it's not one thing that you've got to know, it's a lot of things and you've got to get all of them perfectly right or you've got a problem. So I'm going to ask you quickly to read through these and make your selection. I'm not going to run through each of them. It's a lot of talking. We'll talk through it when we get the answers. All right, quickly read through them and choose your answer. All right. Most of you will begin to get bits of them, but unfortunately with this, you may have got two of the statements perfectly correct and then one of them wrong. And unfortunately that knocks out all the bits that you did get right. Okay. All right, I think we're good. I think we're nearly all there. Okay, good, well done. Well, I hope well done. Maybe I should wait till we've checked our answer first. All right. Can I ask, before I even run through my working out, who got, let's do this slowly, who got, okay, all hands down first. All thumbs down. Got to wait now. Who got A? Okay. Who got B? Who got C? Okay, <laughs> some of you have realized that that looks like a good one to bet on. And who got D? Okay, I also got C, so we're going to run through why I believe C was the right answer. All right, so the first thing that we need to know, and sometimes it helps to write all over your paper, is that as the chain length increases in length, as the chain length or the number of carbons, you've got to be very specific. You can't just say number of carbons. It's usually the number of carbons. I guess you can say number of carbons. It could be the number of carbons in the whole molecule. That's fine. Or the molecular mass, any of these. As these increase, so does the intermolecular forces. The intermolecular forces will be larger. If the intermolecular forces are larger, we will have a higher boiling point. And the reason that we'll have a higher boiling point is if you've got stronger forces, the line that should come in here, is that more energy is needed to overcome them. I know I'm jumping a tiny bit ahead, which is why I've only done one of these questions in here. We're technically gonna do this section in another week at another time. But if we've got stronger forces, they're held together more and we need more energy to pull them apart, and if we've got more energy needed, we'll have to reach a higher temperature before we reach that amount of energy. 
Last thing is if we've got a higher boiling point, less of the substance will boil and therefore we will have a lower vapor pressure. Okay, so you need to realize that as your intermolecular forces become stronger, your boiling point goes up, but your vapor pressure goes down. So there's always a relationship that says high boiling point, low vapor pressure, or low boiling point, all of it has boiled and turned into a gas, or most of it has, therefore it will have a higher vapor pressure. So one will be high and one will be low always. Okay, so if I look at this list, as we go down from P to S, the chain gets longer. So over here, P will have the strongest intermolecular, sorry, the weakest, brain dying, the weakest intermolecular forces, and here we'll have the strongest. Okay, that also means in turn that here we'll have a low boiling point and a high vapor pressure. Here we'll have a high boiling point and a low vapor pressure. Uh, I don't know what that is. Sometimes it helps to actually write little notes like this to yourself so that you're not continuously trying to remember what you said was high and what you said was low. It's very easy to lose track of what you said things were. So let's start. P has the lowest boiling point. I even wrote it down there. Yes, it does. That statement is true. S has the highest boiling point. Yes, it's true. Both statements are true, so I circle one. At this point, if you wished, you could look through your options and see this didn't have one and rule out D, if you wished. You didn't have to do it now, you could do it later. Statement Q, sorry, statement two, says Q has a higher boiling point, but lower vapor pressure than R. So we're actually comparing Q and R. So if we look at these two, Q and R, Q has a higher boiling point, that's nonsense. Q has a lower boiling point, first statement is out, that's all wrong. And anything that says the number two, we can immediately take out. So by a process of elimination, we've already halved the options. Then we look at the next option, which says R has a lower boiling point, but a higher vapor pressure than S. So we're now comparing R and S. R has a lower boiling point, well, it's closer to that end, so that statement is true. Does it have a higher vapor pressure? Well, yes, if it's got a lower boiling point, it has a higher vapor pressure, so that statement is true. Okay, so anything with a three in it is an option. And at that point, you could already see that the answer was C. I find that I always check all four options because you never know when you get to the end and you suddenly read a surprise not. Which of the following is not? And then you're suddenly like, oh wait, that's why the answers are all correct or all wrong or something like that. So the last option here, says that P has the lowest boiling point, which is true, it's right up here, and S has the lowest vapor pressure, Well, S has the highest boiling point, so it does have the lowest vapor pressure. That statement is correct. I'm 100% certain that it's C. Some of you are prepared to commit or would have been prepared to commit after doing the first three statements. I find that it depends on how much time I have left in the paper as to whether I'm prepared to just go and say, you're yeah, close enough, or if I actually want to check just to be sure. I usually recommend if you've got time on your side, rather be sure. Okay, can I quickly double check? Is everybody good with that solution? Does that make sense to everybody? Who got that one right? I think it was the majority of you. Okay, so that's a good sign that you're understanding what you're doing. Okay, so let's clear all of the questions and let's scroll down. All right, okay. Sorry, just jumped itself. Oh, it's really not liking me today. So question 2.3 here says, um, the structural formula of an organic compound is given below. Which of those is, uh, is its IUPAC names? You actually hope for these kind of questions because it's really nice. You don't have to worry about your formatting. You've just got to make sure that you count from the right side and that you count correctly. So I'm going to quickly pause while I try and answer and you can do the same thing as well. Okay, when you've got your answer, give me a thumbs up. Fantastic. Okay. 
So the first thing you had to do here was realize that your longest chain had four carbons, one, two, three, four, and a methyl group on carbon three. Most important here was realizing that the double bond was more important than the methyl group. So you had to start from this end. If you started counting from the other end, you are not prioritizing a double bond. And a double bond is more important in terms of your numbering than anything else that you put on your sides of your chains. Please note, technically, carboxylic acids are more important than anything else, if we're going to go with the really more important. But um, your double bonds are more important than, an, than a methyl side group or a haloalkane. Your alcohols are more important than either of those that I've mentioned. So there's kind of this order of priority. Usually we don't mix things up too much, but here a double bond definitely beats an alkyl side chain. So if you counted there, you'd have a three methyl, a double bond, which is your ene on carbon one, and your answer would be D. Can I quickly ask show of hands who got that correct? Fantastic. I think with this, but anybody that didn't get it, this is us kind of mopping up loose ends and making sure that although you've been practicing as much as I know all of you have, that you've actually been practicing and you've understood where you've gone wrong. All right, so we're now moving on to the slightly longer questions. And over here, we're told that the letters A to F in the table below represents six organic compounds. So we've got A, B, C, D, E, and F. I know with this that I get very frustrated when I have to read the question and I can't see all of the answers. So I've actually prepared for myself an option here where I'm going to have, hopefully it works, two screens showing at the same time. And I can hopefully make my little picture go nice and small at the top. In fact, over there, yeah, that'll work for me now. So um, that hopefully we can understand everything. So this here is a picture of everything that we're looking at here. And just now when we scroll down here, it will be rather nice because we won't have to worry about all of the bits that we've got. Okay, so we probably don't even need to look at that in particular. We can already start scrolling down because all of our pictures are on the side. Okay, I got very frustrated having to scroll up and down the other day and this is my solution. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be working through these together. Question 2.1 says, from the compounds in the table above, write down the letter that represents a ketone, an aldehyde, a compound with the general formula CNH2N plus 2, and a that is a structural isomer of F. All of these, please note, you're, you're just going to be writing down A, B, C, D, E, or F. It is possible that you may have one of them be the answer more than once. There's no specific rule that says you may only use it once. All right. Can I ask you just quickly to answer two point, well, all of question 2.1, all four of them. All right. Go for it. Okay, hey, give me a thumbs up when you've done all four. Well done, that was fast. Good, good. Okay, that's fine. Don't, don't rush yourself. I'd rather give you a tiny bit more time to do this because we've got two more, well, this question and one more to go through. So it should be okay. Some of them may have made you think just a little bit. I think most of this is, at least at this stage, should be more revision and practice than challenging hard. All right, okay, brilliant. I think most of you have got that correct. So I'm gonna share my answer with you. The ketone that I saw was D. For a ketone, you must have a C double bond O between two other carbons. So I was quite happy for that to be my ketone. The aldehyde must have a C double bond O straight on to an H, which makes that my aldehyde, okay? Question 2.1.3, the compound with the formula CNH2N plus two, I am specifically looking for an alkane, which means I'm looking for something that has carbon, hydrogen, nothing else, and no double bonds. 
Now, always with these, just be careful that you don't miss a hidden chlorine. It's the worst thing that can happen. Like here, you may have missed something and not realized there was a hydroxyl group there. So over here, the correct answer is E, a structural isomer of F. Now, please remember structural is not specifying what kind of isomer. So we're not specifically saying, oh, it's got to be a functional isomer or a chain isomer or a positional isomer. Structural isomer, remember, we can drop that word structural completely and just say an isomer of F. I'm going to keep mentioning this idea of structural because I find that the word structural isomer confuses you and you confuse it with the three types that I just meant, I mentioned and then it kind of makes your world fall apart just a little bit. So if we look at compound F, F is heptanoic acid, which makes it a carboxylic acid. Please don't ever write that in exam. That's just my little head abbreviation. It's a carboxylic acid with seven carbons. A carboxylic acid can only really change into an ester. It is possible that we maybe make it a branched carboxylic acid, but I don't see any branched carboxylic acids. So therefore, it's going to be an ester with seven carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm quite happy that that is my answer and the answer is C. All right. Can I quickly ask who got the correct answer here? All four of those. All right, well done. That looks like the majority of you, so that's fantastic. Please, if you've got anything wrong, don't beat yourself up about it. All of this is about learning. None of this counts for anything. So I find that as long as you keep the attitude of, as long as I'm going forward, I'm fine, I'm happy with that. I don't need you to, to get everything right in order to be doing well. All right, the next question here asks us to write down the IUPAC name of compounds A and D. So you're going to write down the IUPAC name of compound A followed by the IUPAC name of compound D. I'm going to do it in this little space that I've got above here, but I'm going to give all of you a quick chance to try it on your own and see what you get for A and what you get for D. Go for it. Okay, when you've got your answer, yeah, some of you have beaten me. That's impressive. <laughs> well done. <laughs> okay. All right. I don't know if some of you had, had hands up even before I went and checked. Well done. Okay, good. I see some of the thumbs still coming in, so I'm going to give you just a little bit longer. You must please give me feedback if I'm pushing you to answer questions too quickly. You can actually turn around and say, whoa, I'm going way too fast and slow down. Give us a little bit longer because the whole point of these is for you to be able to, to do them. Sometimes a little bit of pressure is good because it kind of, I guess, mock because it simulates the, the exam pressure of someone where you always feel like they're looking over your shoulder. But um, yeah, please note, teachers don't actually do that. Whoever's invigilating really isn't reading your answers. Sometimes they are, but that's really unlikely. Okay, so what I got for the first answer, so I actually labeled them A and D. You sh I should have done them as 2.1. Um, the IUPAC name of compound A, if you look at it, ooh, I actually got it wrong. I suddenly looked at that. It's not pentanoic acid. It's pentanal. Oops, when you look harder. So it is an aldehyde. There are five carbons in the longest chain. You could have made them those five or you could have branched down. It doesn't matter. Either way, there's a methyl group on carbon four. So it is four methyl pentanyl. And then for D, it's um, a ketone. So it's got the ending own and it's got three carbons. So it's propanone. All right. Can I quickly ask who got both of those correct? Fantastic. Well done. These are good signs if you're getting them right. If you're getting them wrong, once again, don't panic. Look at the little mistakes that you've made. 
I mean, most of you saw that I nearly made a mistake there because I wasn't paying attention. At least when I looked at it again and was trying to explain, I was like, wait, no, look, different functional group. So make sure that you also check over your own work and that you don't do that to yourself. All right. The next question, which is 2.3, says compound C is prepared in a laboratory. Once again, it's an ester. So how can one quickly confirm that compound C is the product formed? You're going to have to think a little bit about that. There's something specific about that type of compound that allows you to, I guess, tell if it's around, being very skip, well, very kind of cryptic here. I can't give you the answer just yet. And then the second question is to write down the IUPAC name of the alcohol needed for the, form, um, for the preparation of compound C. So can I ask everybody, that should not take you very long. Quickly give those two a go. Okay, I haven't yet asked for a show of hands, but some of you do it automatically. Who's, just quickly give me a thumbs up again, because I'm only looking for the first time now. Thumbs up if you've got it. Fantastic. Who knows the answer to the first question? Before I share it with you, who knows the answer? How can one quickly confirm that it's formed? All right. The smell, please, that is correct. It's an ester. Esters are typically used as fragrances. So if you'd made this ester, you would smell it. I can't tell you what it would smell like because I don't learn the different fragrances of esters off by heart. But um, some of the examples are esters smell like mint or wintergreen. For me, that's the smell of Christmas pine needles. Or some of them smell like different fruits. A lot of you may have done a practical earlier on in the year where you actually made them. I don't always think that esters smell nice, but they definitely smell. Um, just an interesting fact, if you buy a second-hand car, okay, just a quick question, why do they, do they smell bad afterwards? I don't think that it's, they smell bad. I find the smell of esters to be irritating. I don't like it. Um, it's artificial, and I don't really like artificial fragrances so much. Um, but I guess a lot of perfumes properly done are a mixture of different esters, so I shouldn't moan too much. But if you buy a second-hand car, it is technically possible for them to get a spray. There's the smell of new car. So you can put a spray of new car smell in your car to get the, the ambiance going. All right. And then the question for the IUPAC name of the alcohol need for the preparation of C. Um, if you draw a line down the middle there, you'll see that it needs a total of one, two, three four carbons, so it's going to be butanol. The um, carboxylic acid that we would have needed had three carbons, so it would be propanoic acid. Okay, and the last question on this particular activity, I'm circling E, that's the wrong one, is they want you to please draw out the full structural formula of compound F, which is our heptanoic acid. All right, so I'm going to quickly pause sharing and draw that for you so that we can compare them. Okay, go for it. Doesn't matter which side you draw it from as long as you draw it correctly. And please draw every single hydrogen. I know you guys love to take shortcuts on this, but unfortunately, if you take shortcuts now, chances are in the middle of an exam when you've got a thousand other thoughts on your mind, drawing or filling in all of your hydrogens is not going to be the first thought that pops to mind. So just do it as a routine thing so that it's a, a habit and you don't suddenly start breaking that habit. All right, thumbs up when you're done with that. Okay. All right, so I'm going to share what I've got here with you. So over there, 
that's my structure. You basically needed seven carbons in a row, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, with the C double bond OH. Please note if you started from the other end, you could have a C double bond OH and then seven more carbons, but you basically have to, have, sorry, six more carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six. And I'm about to do this the stupid way. Every single one of your hydrogens. So I'm not prepared to leave it bland or empty of hydrogens because if I, I find if I do that, then I give you permission to do that. And that's a very bad idea. All right. So there we go. All right. Now, out of curiosity, and just because I think it's an important thing to do, I want you to quickly see if you can total up what you would have got out of 13. Just so you know, when we give the IUPAC naming, you get the split part of naming. So over here, where this was the four methyl, one, two, three, four, five, um, pent and L. If you had pent and L, you got one. And if you had the four methyl, you got a mark. And if you had both parts, you got both bits. So quite often, just having the stem which is basically that bit, okay? So it could sometimes be pentane or whatever, you get the full mark. For D, if you had, um, oh, I guess D is a bit of a tricky one. D was um, propanone. Um, I think it's if you've got the prop here, you may have got a mark, and then the anone's another one. Please for this one, if you called it 2-propanone or prop and 2 own, it's still, both of those are correct. We don't have to put in the position of the carbonyl group because it can only be in one position. All right. I hope everybody's good with this. Can I quickly ask? Let's see what kind of marks we got. 13. Well done. Okay, I, th I was pausing there because I thought there was no one, but that's fantastic. 12. 11. 10. 9. I think we're going to leave it there on nine or eight, okay? Because I think most of you would have gotten that kind of range. So well done. All right, moving on to the last question that we're dealing with today, which I actually think was pretty well timed in terms of how many questions we could handle. Okay, I've got six more compounds. They're just scrolling up eventually. And what I'm going to do here is I'm just quickly going to use my snipping tool to take a screenshot again of the tables that we can use it. All right. Okay, so here's my snipping tool with my screen. Here are my questions. Okay, questions do follow at the bottom. All right. Okay, so you can see everything here. These come from a rather old exam paper, which is why they look a little bit funny if you look at some of the diagrams. So I think teachers, I think this was from about um, almost 10 years ago, teachers have got a lot better at drawing these on the computer. There's special programs that allow you to draw them a little bit neater. So sometimes they get a little bit, or they used to be a little bit messy. The one that I think is likely here to cause a little bit of an issue is number C. Please, it should not technically be examinable, but I'd like to cover it nevertheless, because if anything like that does pop up, I don't want you to be caught off guard. I don't want you to suddenly have to go, oh my gosh, this is the 90% question, and I don't have the tools to answer it. So for question 3.1, it says write down the appropriate letters that represent each of the following, and very importantly, something may be used more than once. You remember that, that's very important. So we're looking for something that's an unsaturated hydrocarbon or hydrocarbons. A little bit of a hint here. Um, I guess I've given you a couple of options. I don't know why one of them's out of two. This is weird mark allocations. Usually if something can be used more than once, we'd ask for only one or something like that. So all of these are out of two, so it's a bit strange with the numbering. But as I said, it's an old question. The compound used for flavoring or fragrance, big hint, we looked at that briefly, an aldehyde, two alkanes, and two that have a carbonyl group here. And bear in mind, we've already established that we might have a carbonyl, which is viewing something that has just a C double bond O as a carbonyl. Once again, I don't like that use of the word carbonyl, but I'm prepared to run with it for today. All right, so I'm gonna pause sharing and ask you to quickly put in all of your answers. Go for it. Please put in anything that applies.
and be careful. Okay, if you've got all of that, I'm going to ask you to quickly give me a thumbs up. Okay, fantastic. All right. Okay, now I think I may actually, when we go through this, have to correct myself if anything else pops up that I didn't put in, but I'm, I'm going to be prepared for the fact that we may just have to change it. So, a substance that is an unsaturated hydrocarbon, if it is unsaturated, that means it has a double or a triple carbon-carbon bond. P is an alky alkyne, so I'm prepared to put it in. Please note, that is not a carbon-carbon double bond. That is not a carbon-carbon double bond. So, the ruling here that we do, that's rather mean, is if you wrote just B, you get two marks. If you wrote more than one thing, I'd be tempted to say that you lose the marks and you get nothing. So I'd almost mark this negatively. I mean, um, fortunately for you, that isn't really how it works. In an exam, I think what happens is we mark the first answer and we ignore everything else. Okay. So if if you were asked for two things, we mark the first two and we ignore everything else. I'd very much like to penalize someone who put in A or who put in D or who put in F because they thought there was a double bond O. But please just be aware of the fact that C double bond O does not make something unsaturated. So an unsaturated substance has a double or a triple bond. The compound used for flavoring or fragrance is our ester which makes it ethyl butanoate, which is F, okay? An aldehyde, I only saw A, because there is its formal group. Two compounds that are alkanes, that is butane and this. Does anyone know what we call this? I'll give you a hint. It's got three carbons, and whenever we join them all together, we call it cyclo, whatever the name is. So this over here, any guesses from anyone? Okay, don't panic. It's called cyclo. Cyclopropane is correct. And cyclopropane is actually a very unstable substance because you actually, you learned about bond angles in grade 11. You are squashing those carbons and you are forcing them into a shape they don't want to be in. If any of your teachers had organic molecule building kits, they actually build things out of carbon and you kind of use things that looks like straws to join them. I remember trying to make cyclopropane at university and it was a pain. It kept bending all of my straws. My straws would actually be so uncomfortable that they'd kind of get squashed in half because that's the amount of strain. We call it, well, it's technically a kind of steric strain. That's the kind of strain those kind of bonds create. This is not technically examinable, but it is worth just having a healthy idea that it exists. Okay, so the two compounds that were alkanes were C and E, even if you couldn't name it, you could write it down. And the two that have a carbonyl group, I would say that being official, the only one that actually has a carbonyl group is D. But if we're viewing them as just having a C double bond O group, then I'd say that it's A, which is my aldehyde, D, which is my ketone, and F, which is my ester. They technically were three, even though the question only asked for two. All right, who got all of those correct? Anyone? Well done. I have a sneaky suspicion that some of the people that got things wrong would have got things wrong because of the C double bond O. I'd love it if none of you did. I'd love it if that was the case. But I think, unfortunately, it seems to be one of those mistakes that people make at least a few times 
before they realize that you you can't talk about them being saturated that way all right so just give me a second uh where's the rest of this question gone okay this is another question so that's not part of it let me just check i hope i haven't really reached the end of this question i have oh my goodness okay we've only got a few questions left okay so the questions here i'm probably going to have to come up with more for you just now because i do think that sadly adds up to 16. the last little bit was the previous question i put in twice don't panic about it so the question here is to write down the iupac name of compound c oh i've ruined that all for you what was the iupac name of compound c it was cyclopropane so i'm going to be really boring here and i'm going to ask everybody to instead let's do a simple one can everybody please name compound B for me? Okay, I know it's easy, but there's nothing wrong with easy. It doesn't mean they don't ask it because it's easy. In fact, I've seen questions where in the exam, the question was to draw ethene and people got it wrong. Please don't be those people. All right, so you're now writing out their UPAC name for me of compound B. There you go, I changed it to B. Okay, a thumbs up when you're done. Good, well done. If you are at an IEB school, this would not be examinable, just so you know, for, for whatever reason, they don't test triple bonds. Okay, so if I quickly share this back with everybody, I've got it as propine. Please note, you could have called it one propine or prop one iron, and it's still correct, but technically, we could only number it from this position because whichever side we put the triple bond on, that would be carbon one. So we actually can't have two different versions. So we've got, you're not going to get two different isomers of this. There's only one. Can I ask everybody to please now draw out the structural formula of compound F? Basically, they're asking you to draw ethyl butanoate. Please, can I ask you to do that for me now? Please draw every one of your hydrogens. I know I can't see all of your individual work, but I'd like to hope very much that when we're finished with this, your work looks almost identical to mine. I'm drawing both way around, or both ways around, just so that you can check yours and be sure. Please try and draw them so that they look like they're going in a line. Some people do draw them at weird angles and they make it overly complicated. All right, I presume, can I just quickly ask if you've already got an answer, quickly give me a thumbs up. Well done. Okay. <laughs> Some people are taking a little bit longer than others. I'm not certain if that's thinking time or still working there. <coughs> so if I look at this now, I see, I did stop pausing. Yes, that it is ethyl. So on the side of the O that you can see here, I need two carbons there or two carbons there that comes from the alcohol. Then there are on the other side from the butanoic acid, there are one, two, three, four carbons. One, two, three. Ooh, one, two, three, four. Please note you should not have this line through the oxygen. It just helps me with busy working out what I need to have. All right, last question on the sheet to please write down the IUPAC name of the alcohol needed to prepare compound F. All right, so I'm going to quickly pause the sharing. Please write down the name of the alcohol needed. All right, give me a thumbs up if you've got your answer.
Fantastic. All right. So I said that the, oh, I didn't get the answer right at all. Let's just quickly erase that and redo it. It would be ethanol. <laughs> all right. So it is ethanol because you've got ethyl and that tells you that this bit is going to come from your alcohol. So the answer there is going to be ethanol. All right. Who got ethanol right? Okay, good. I bet none of you wrote the wrong answer like that. Oh, that's so funny when that happens. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we've now answered all the questions, but we've still got about four minutes. And I unfortunately don't want you to be in a position where you don't get the full benefit of your time. You did earn it. So I'm going to quickly ask a couple of random questions. If the question asked, what is the inorganic, the inorganic substance needed in order to make compound F. What is the inorganic reactant? That's probably a better word. The inorganic reactant needed in order to prepare compound F. Does anybody have any ideas? The inorganic reactant or reagent needed to prepare compound F. That is correct, Nasir. It is H2SO4 or sulfuric acid. Remember that you use sulfuric acid as a catalyst in the esterification process. It acts as either a catalyst, some people, though it's the slightly less popular option and also slightly less accurate answer, some people say that it's a dehydrating agent. Next question, what is the inorganic product formed when we make compound F? What is the inorganic product formed when we make compound F? Good, it's water. So we're gonna make water as a byproduct. Now, the reason that I'm mentioning these big words is that a lot of people get thrown by somebody saying organic or inorganic product. And you need to be ready for the fact that organic should be something where you can identify its homologous series. If you can't identify its homologous series in its functional group, you usually can write it off as being inorganic. So inorganic substances are things like acids, usually, but please be careful, our carboxylic acids do fall under organic. So they could be acids, bases, um, salts, water, those kind of things. So just be aware of the fact that they're often used in the reactions or they're produced by the reactions, um, especially when we actually do proper reactions for organic chemistry. All right. So the question here is, is the reversal of esterification hydrolysis or hydration? I'd say that it's hydrolysis. Okay, so the technical term, I'd, I'd be happier with saying, sorry, there was a question that said, what is the reversal of um, esterification called? It is a hydrolysis reaction. So it is physically possible for us to take an ester, add water to it, and have it, to spl have it split back into its alcohol and its carboxylic acid. Usually that reaction is acid catalyzed, which means that we have to put in not just water, but a little bit of acid. I wouldn't say... I wouldn't describe it as hydration per personally. Um, hydration for me is usually where you add water and it adds across a double bond. But we haven't yet done any types of addition reactions. All right. Okay. So what I'd like to do at this point, I think we're nearly at time, is I just quickly want to ask, does anybody have any last questions for me linked to what we've done so far on organic chemistry? Anyone? Okay, wonderful. Then I think that makes this the end of the, the masterclass on um, organic chemistry.